written four books and a whole bunch of essays. And he was what the French call an homme de lettres, a man of letters, which means that his books were essays, reflections, they weren't monographs, they weren't academic studies, they weren't novels, that's what they were. And many of his essays were strongly political in nature. One of the books that he wrote that created a, a storm, so I learned by reading about it in 1928, and I say about it because I find the book itself almost unreadable, <laughs> is it, he, he, it's called Caliban Bao, Caliban Speaks. Now, Caliban is not just Shakespeare's Caliban, it's a philosopher whom, and historian whom Gaino admired, Ernest de Renan who had written a philosophical drama based loosely, very loosely based, on Shakespeare's Tempest, uh, in which Caliban, this is, by the way, is to me another absolutely unreadable work, a philosophical <laughs> drama, but I try it. But Caliban is, represents sort of stupid but salvageable people, the people who are dumb, but you can get something out of them and maybe democracy can be saved. Maybe. So Gano answered by writing Caliban Speaks, and he writes in the name of the people. And it has, I quote some, of, some things from it in the introduction, which are quite powerful and quite good, but most of it is sort of an <laughs> allegorical ramble. It's very hard to read. But at the time, it created a furor because this was the people answering back and so forth. Let me go on to, I'll come back to Gano as an intellectual. I want to, I want to simply say how he earned his living which is by teaching. But what he taught was, and here I'll have to explain the French system, it's called Cagne in France, and this I'll have to backtrack again. <laughs> if you want to get into the most prestigious schools in France, particularly the most, let's say the most prestigious school in the humanities, which could be history, philosophy, uh, literature, any literature, that's the École Normale Supérieure, the superior the normal school, it's called. Okay, that's where Sartre and Beauvoir went, for example. Okay? It still produces the intellectual elite of France in the humanities and also in sciences in another division of it. If you want to get into that, there's a national competitive examination. They don't ask about extracurricular activities. There are no interviews. They don't look at what you did in high school. You have an exam. And the exam is competitive. That is, there is a certain number of places. And all of France who can and who wants to takes this exam. They have, let's say, 200 places for all of France. I'm making up the figure. And if you're 201, goodbye. If you're 200, okay, you're in. If you're first, of course you're in. Okay. To prepare for this exam, it's so difficult. You take two years after high school. That's after you pass the back, the back of the oh, yeah, the exam that gets you out of high school and automatically into college, but not into the école normale. Okay. You take two extra years, and they're called cagne. And according to people I know, the Economie is a relaxed place. For one thing, the government pays you, unlike the states where elite schools are extremely expensive. In France, if you get into the Ecole Normale, you have a room and board paid for and a small stipend. Buy books or whatever. Go to movies. You know? But um, the, the, uh, the, the, the classes in, in Cannes are generally lectures. Gaynaud's classes had about 50 students in them. I don't know how many there are today. And they're thought of by people in the École Normale as much tougher than the École Normale, where you can do what you like. <laughs> it, it's very rigorous. That's what he taught. Okay? Now, as I say in my introduction, which I'll quote from memory at this point, this could be the portrait of many French intellectuals in 1940, but there's one tremendous difference. Gaynaud was born in a poor town in Brittany, which had been recently industrialized, Fougère. Not so poor today, but it was then. And his father worked as a worker in a shoe factory, and his mother did piecework for the shoe factory. Not only that, but his father got sick and could no longer work in the factory, so the family had only the money his mother could make. He had to go into the factory at the age of 14 and work. Well, how did he become what he is? What he wasn't, what, what he was then. Well, very simple. He studied at night. Because somehow he got the love of books, the love of learning. He studied nights, and his mother said, you're, you're using up all our candles, because they had no electric light. This is a long time ago in Brittany. But he kept at it. He passed the bat, 
And then he got a scholarship after that to go to Cannes and the Ecole Normale. So he went up the ladder, you know, the, the French intellectual elite ladder, as it were, and became a teacher to who prepared students for the exam that gets you into the Ecole Normale. And that means that he had a definite curriculum to teach, which is essentially all of French literature, which he lectured on. Okay? And you, there's a lot of references to that in this, in this diary. Uh, so that's what he did. Was that your question? <laughs> <laughs>
but he can't not write. That's part of his life. So he wrote this diary, and he, he poured everything he had into it. But his the orange juice he had or didn't have for breakfast, the dog, he has a dog, as you've learned in passing. There's never this one mention, because dogs have now been requisitioned by the Nazis if they're over a certain size. And he measures his dog and finds he's too small. <laughs> Good. First time you know he's a dog. Hey, that's unheard of in diaries. You know, in diaries, if the dog's part of the household, you talk about the dog. Not in this diary. So that, that's one thing he does. This is Gano's announcement of his, this is his first diary entry when, you know, on June 17th, 1940. <coughs> there, it's over. At half past noon, an old man who doesn't even have the voice of a man anymore, but talks like an old woman, informed us that last night he had asked for peace. I think of all our young people. It was cruel to see them leave for the war. But is it less cruel to force them to live in a country that has lost its honor? I will never believe that men are made for war. But I know they are not made for servitude either. Now, look what he does. <coughs> Notes the speech, and his reaction to it is evident. He can't stand the voice of faith down, right? He talks like an old woman, right? And it's true. He's a, he, I've heard you know, recordings of Pitt down. He had a quavering old man's voice like that when he was 84, okay? Then he goes into a general reflection about, I think, of the youth. It's cruel, cruel for them to ask them. And then he said, even a more general reflection. I'll never believe that men are made for war, which was his attitude before, because after fighting in World War I, he became a pacifist. But he dropped his pacifism when the Nazis began, as many intellectuals did, when the Nazis began getting extremely strong. Right? And then the last reflection, but I know they are not made for servitude either. So it's a diary of reactions to events which are, which often turn into general moral reflections or political reflections um, and his inner emotions. It's March 13th, 1943. Why I keep this diary? To remember and to put a bit of order inside me, inside my life through discipline, the way one does exercises. But it would be unfortunate if I contented myself with these notes, these disjointed fragments with no rhythm to them. All this cannot make a book. A great book is a rhythm that imposes itself on the reader. So he has a little, he's a literary man, he has some literary ambition, plus, and he says this a number of times in other parts of the diary, he wants the structure of an ordered French. He doesn't want the eloquence the, for the, of the masses that he hears when he turns on the radio and listens to Hitler, because he notes that he listens to Hitler on the radio. He knows German. Uh, and, and, you know, he listens to his rants and analyzes them and notices how people react to it. He doesn't want that kind of eloquence, but he wants an ordered style. And then he says to remember in this. Well, that means bearing witness to what he sees which are often the ordinary facts of daily life under the occupation. Uh, people lining up for food, food rationing, uh, stupid conversations that he hears when people wait online and he overhears them and can't stand it. <laughs> but that's what he hears. Uh, and particularly the actions of his fellow intellectuals, which he treats with scathing irony. Uh, when when the, the, this wonderful literary magazine, the NL have was banned, of course, but then comes out again with a fascist as the editor, a very famous fascist, Brieux La Rochelle, who was a, a novelist, uh, committed suicide when he, when France was when Paris was liberated, uh, and Brieux actually keeps asking Gaino to, to contribute something. Gaino, it enrages him, but when it comes out. Gaino looks, reads through the NRF and says, oh, it's just wonderful. It's not enough to betray your country. You have to betray it with style. You have to betray it beautifully. <laughs> you know, talking about the right man. So, wait, so to finish that about for yourself, it's important for Gaino because I think he, he's presenting his self-image in the diary to himself as someone who will not give up. And even he says, he even says very early on, I can't talk out loud. I, I can't say anything to anyone. So 
I'm going to just bury myself in silence and in, and in work. I'm going to write a biography of Rousseau, an homme qui ne se rend pas, a man who does not surrender. And so even his writing to Rousseau, and by the way, here's the book that he wrote about Rousseau. He's, this, Nielsen's two copies. I noticed it, as I told Jenny, I noticed it was taken out by a Smith student in 1978 from Baldwin House. <laughs> well, you know, sure. Unless you're a graduate student, these are two hefty volumes of the life of Rousseau. There are many other books. So, yeah, that's what he buries himself in. But even that has a meaning. So, yeah, I think the real reason is, is to hold on to himself. This is what I am. I'm someone who resists. I write French with order and rhythm, and I know what's going 